take comfort in the fact that God is sovereign over all the circumstances of your life and praise God in the darkness. Let God's word strengthen your heart. There should be a passion in our heart to tell everybody how they can come to know Jesus Christ. God's word this morning, and would you please open to uh, 1 John chapter 2 this morning, 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to be reading verses 1 down to verse number 7, and would you stand for the reading of God's word, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. And hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. And brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye heard from the beginning. Thank you so much. You may be seated. And pray with me. Father, thank you for your inspired and errant word. Thank you, Lord, for how it edifies us. And so help us today to learn Uh, some valuable lessons from it, and help me, Lord, to communicate it clearly. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I heard about a little boy who was standing by the roadside, and a man came along who was uh, lost, and the man said to the little boy, he said, son, do you know how to get to town? The little boy said, I don't know. He said, well, where is Route 20? The little boy said, "I I don't know. He said, well, where does this road go? The little boy said, I don't know. He said, well, what's the name of this street? The little boy said, I don't know. The man finally in exasperation said, well, you really don't know anything for sure, do you? And the little boy said, I know that I ain't lost. (laughs) It's a good thing to know. That's especially true spiritually speaking, to know that you're not lost. John is the apostle of assurance, and he wants you to know certain things. <clears throat> Contrary to this postmodern world that says you can't know anything for sure, John says there are th- definitely things that you can know for sure. In fact, the word know is used so frequently in this letter. Over and over again, he says there are certain things that you need to know. In fact, this is the dominant theme of First John. He writes to remove doubts. He writes to remove uncertainty He writes to correct bad theology. But the major idea, I would say, is he wants you to know above all things. He wants you to know with absolute certainty that you are saved. He wants you to have a total assurance of salvation. I think this is the main, uh, most important thing I should say in the life of any person, to know this with absolute certainty certainty. There's no way to overemphasize the importance of this one issue. I feel that the church today is filled with people who think that they're saved, but they're lost. That's especially true, I think, here in America. You say, why would you say that? Well, I'm just telling you what Jesus said. Jesus said in in Matthew chapter 7, these are the most haunting verses in all the Bible, He said in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. And then he says this, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me. That is the most haunting passage in the New Testament. To have that kind of self-deception, 
for a person to actually believe that they're going to heaven, to think that they're entering in those pearly gates, only to be told that, no, that's not your destination. You're not going to heaven. And I think that there are many people who come to church all over in America, and they have a false assurance. And I feel that preachers and churches are partly responsible for this. I think it's because of the way the typical church operates. Normally, the pastors of churches are more concerned about building a big crowd and getting a a lot of people in than to be thorough with the Word of God and to make sure that people are really a part of the kingdom. It's more important for you to be a part of the kingdom of God than to have your name on the church membership roll here. That's much more important. So how does the church today typically function? Well, first of all, there's weak preaching. There's no doctrinal truth. There's no depth of Scripture. There's nothing really definitive that is said. Superficial sermons designed to make people feel good about themselves. In fact, I had not in this church, but in another church, I pastored a guy. I was greeting people as they left, and he was leaving, and he said, I'm not coming back because you don't make me feel good about myself. Well, let me just say that it's not my job to make you feel good about yourself. In fact, it's my job to offend you. It's my job to make sure that you're walking the way the Lord wants you to walk. And if you're just preaching the truth, guess what? The Word of God can be offensive. It's not the things that I don't understand in the Bible that trouble me. It's the things that I do understand that trouble me. And so there's no real expositional preaching. What is expository preaching. It's just making the text clear. It's just saying what the text says. In fact, that's what the word homiletics mean. Homo, the same letic to say, to say the same thing, to say the same thing that the Scripture says. It's not my job to make up sermons. God's already cooked the meal. I just have to deliver it without messing it up. I'm not a chef. I'm a waiter. And God's already made it. He's already made it. I just need to get it to you. I just need to communicate what God says the way he wanted it to be said, to get at the correct meaning of the Scripture because the meaning of the Scripture is the Scripture. And the power is not in me. The power is in the message. It's in the Word. That's why it's so important to make it clear and get it right. I'm not called to entertain congregations or to tell stories. I'm called to preach the Word and make the Word of God clear. Paul, Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, preach the Word be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For a time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Beloved, that day is here. We have a lot of preaching like that designed to, to satisfy itching ears. And so there's weak preaching in a lot of churches. And then there's, along with that, the shallow gospel. A gospel where sinners are never really confronted with the holy God. They're never really confronted with the fact that the wrath of God abides on them because they have broken God's law. The average gospel message starts out with the love of God. God loves you and he wants to meet you on your terms. God is so anxious to accept you. He's ready to come to you. He wants to fulfill all of your dreams, give you a life of satisfaction and fulfillment. You know, we treat God like he's a genie in the Bible, like it's the bottle. You just open the Bible and the genie pops out and gives you whatever you want. And if God starts to interfere in your life too much, you just put him back in the bottle. That's the way God is presented in a lot of ways. After all, we want Jesus as our Savior. Nobody wants to go to hell. We just don't want him really controlling our life. We want to do what we want to do, live how we want to live. We want him as Savior. We don't want him as Lord. That's a false gospel that permeates the church. And there's no concept of holiness or wrath, no understanding of true repentance, no submission to the Lordship of Christ, no picking up the cross, dying to self, no brokenness over sins committed. In fact, all of the offense of the gospel is absolutely removed. And the gospel is no longer offensive. And let me tell you something. If you're not offended by the gospel, I'm probably not preaching it right. The gospel has an offense to it. 
when Paul systematically lays out the gospel in Romans, he doesn't start with the love of God, he starts with the wrath of God. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That is to say, they're pushing back the truth, they're suppressing the truth. You understand that anyone who has not repented, who has not obeyed the call of the gospel, is under the wrath of God right now? You understand that? John says this, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Any sinner who has not repented is an enemy of God. And the Bible says that very clearly. God's wrath is on that person because of their sinfulness and because of breaking the law of God. And salvation is that reconciliation of that relationship where we're no longer enemies with God, but we're at peace with God. And that peace is made available because of what Jesus did on the cross at Calvary. Colossians 1.21 says, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. How does God reconcile sinners to himself? Through the cross, through what Jesus did on the cross, through his atoning death. And when a person is saved, what are they saved from? They're saved from God. They're saved from the wrath of God. That wrath that abides on every sinner. So we, you know, God's not here to give you a fulfilled life. What you need to worry about is to make sure you're reconciled to God, to make sure that you're no longer enemies of God, but that you have put your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. The gospel is good news, but it's only good news because of the badness of the bad news. And the bad news is, if you haven't repented, if you haven't turned to God and obeyed the call of the gospel and trusted Jesus as your only Savior and Lord, the bad news is God's wrath is on you, and when you die, you spend eternity in hell. Hell is the full expression of the wrath of God. That's the bad news. The good news is he offers forgiveness of sins because Christ paid your sin debt on the cross. Repent of your sin, put your faith in Christ, and be reconciled. And by the way, there's nothing else that you can do. There's no work that you can do. And you see, that's why the gospel is offensive to many, because people don't like to see themselves as sinners, unworthy of doing anything to satisfy the holiness of God. Their pride will not allow them to humble themselves and to repent. So what does the church do? Well, we, the church, not this church, not me, but the average church just tones the gospel message down to make it less offensive. We remove words like repentance or we change the meaning of it. Or we say, well, you can accept Jesus as your Savior, but not your Lord. You don't have to submit to him and all of that. And so we present God as if he's willing to meet us on our terms whenever we're ready. There are so many wrong versions of the gospel being preached today. And if you don't like the gospel that you get here, you know what? You can go to another church and they'll, they'll give you a gospel that you like. We have the consumer mentality has invaded the church in America today. You don't get what you want here? Fine. You can surely find it somewhere else. There are people out there willing to give that to you. And that's why there are so many lost people in churches today that fill membership roles. And then add to, add to that, there's this man-made assurance we give people their assurance of salvation as if we could do such a thing. We just say, oh, just, you just pray this prayer and you write down the date and the time and the place when you decided to accept Jesus. Now, let me just say this. I'm, look, if you know the exact moment that you were saved, that's fine. I, I'm glad that that's true of you. If you can remember the exact day, time, and place, that's wonderful. I'm just simply saying that there's nowhere in Scripture that says that if you can remember a day, time, and a place when you pray to prayer, that that's a biblical basis of assurance of salvation. I don't see that anywhere. In fact, I don't even see the terminology accept Jesus. The question is not whether you accept Jesus. The question is whether Jesus accepts you. 
And he only accepts those who are truly repentant. Those who have truly put their faith in his finished work. And so many people, they just pray a prayer. They write down the day, time, and the place. And if they ever doubt, they pull out that card and say, I remember. There's no change in their life. There's no spiritual growth. There's no sanctification. There's no pursuing holiness. There's no spiritual disciplines in their life. There's no church attendance. They still live like the world. They live in continual sin. But they don't doubt their salvation because they remember the date and the time and the place. And then, you know, what we do in the church is we, we create a new classification of Christians. We say, oh, well, they're just carnal Christians. They're carnal. Uh, they, they made a decision to accept Jesus. They're just living like the world. They're, that's called carnal Christian. Really? I don't see that in the Bible anywhere. If you live in the flesh, if you live like the world, you're just a carnal Christian. In fact, in Galatians... Chapter 5, the Apostle Paul, when he talked about this conflict between the flesh and the spirit, and he said this, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, rash, dry, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, if you're not on that list, such like, of which I tell you before, and I've told you in time past, that they which do such things are just carnal Christians? Is that what he said? They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I didn't say that. Paul said that. Now, let me just say, a, a true believer may lapse into carnality, but they're not going to live continually in carnality. It's possible for a believer to be carnal. I'm just saying it's not their full pattern of life. It's not the way they just continually live in that unbroken pattern. That's not true salvation. Paul said, if, if this is what your life is like, if this characterizes you, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we say, oh, they're just carnal Christians. They just need to get rededicated. You can't dedicate something that wasn't dedicated in the first place. You can't rededicate that. And so people have a false assurance and they never come to grips with their real, their real spiritual condition because we've taken away that idea of wrestling and examining yourself by just making this classification of carnal Christian. If you can put yourself in that classification, you don't ever have to really examine yourself, do you? Or to make sure that you're really in the kingdom of God. And so I think the church in America today is filled with people who are lost and what the church in America has to do is, you know, we have to keep the crowds coming. And God knows it's not going to be expositional preaching that does that because only saved people are really interested in understanding and knowing the Word. Lost people need a little bit more. They need to be entertained. So we, we change our church services around to entertain. We even, have, we even send people nowadays down to Las Vegas at Bally's Casinos to figure out how to put on a big show, to how to use the lights and the smoke and all the other stuff to make church more interesting. We have to invent new programs that appeal to the natural desires. We have to have style. Ministry is now all about style. Let me just tell you something. You'll never see me with a T-shirt on and jeans on Sunday morning. Now, if that's what you're looking for, you just may as well go somewhere else. You'll never see this preacher in skinny jeans, I promise you that. <laughs> you wouldn't want that. But we have to have style. So we end up entertaining goats instead of feeding sheep. And all of this begs the question, how may a person have a genuine biblical assurance of their salvation? Well, that's really the whole purpose of 1 John. That is one of the main reasons why he writes this letter. You know why? Because there were believers in the church, the community of churches that he knew back then that were confused about this matter. And the reason there was confusion is because some errant doctrine was invading the church. There was a group in the church that said that they had a new, improved version of Christianity 
that was based on knowledge, real spiritual knowledge that only the enlightened could get. This group is called Gnostics. It's an early version of Gnosticism. And they basically went around saying, you know, we have this special anointing, we have this special knowledge, and if you're not privy to have this enlightenment that we have, then you're probably not really genuinely a Christian. And so this caused many in the church to really wonder, and they were concerned. And, and to add to that, this, this enlightened group, they ended up leaving the church, saying, you know, we need to do our own thing. And they left behind them a, a, a group of confused and broken people who were wondering if what they had was the real thing. And John writes to let them know. Look at 1 John chapter 2. Look at verse number 19. He says, They went out from us because they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that it might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. You don't need that special enlightenment that you talk about. You already have the Holy Spirit. And so John is writing this group, and what he does here in this whole letter, we're going to just kind of do a summary of the letter in the time that I have left here. And just he gives some tests of true, genuine salvation, real assurance to make sure that you know that you are in the family of God, that you are a child of God. And I want, to, I want you to just listen as we go through these tests that are in 1 John. I want you to examine your own heart. Did you know that the New Testament calls upon us to examine ourselves constantly? The New Testament writers are doing that all the time, saying make sure that you're in the faith. Make sure that you know the Lord. So let me just give you these tests. Here's the first one. I call this the communion test. Do you have fellowship with Christ and the Father? Look in 1 John chapter 1. Look at verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father was manifest unto us. And that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. And so really the question is, do you enjoy fellowship with Christ and the Father? And what John is describing here is a communion and a fellowship that he enjoyed with Christ and the Father. And if you're saved, Jesus will not be just a person in history that you heard about. He will be a spiritual reality in your heart. You'll have a heart-to-heart fellowship with Christ that's very real on a spiritual level. You'll have a genuine love for Christ and for the Father. You'll just love Christ. You'll love God. This is what Jonathan Edwards called holy affections. I'm sure you read about the great revival that swept through America back in the 1700s. It's called the Great Awakening. And during that time, many people were converted, but there was also a large group of people that it became clear that were not truly converted. There was a lot of emotional excess that was taking place along with that revival. And people began to criticize and say, this revival isn't real. And Jonathan Edwards was looking at it, and he said, no, there are real conversions, and there are those who are not real. And so he wrote a book to help people discern, and he The title of the book is a treatise on uh, concerning religious affections. But what he said basically, in order to expose uh, false conversion and to help people understand real conversion, he said the supreme proof of true salvation is what he called holy affections. What is that? It is a genuine love for Christ, a genuine longing for Christ and the Father. This is characteristic of anyone who is truly saved. You will truly love Jesus. Jesus will be spiritually real to you, not just a person in history. So, what does Jesus mean to you? Is is he the dominant person in your life now that you became a Christian? Is your knowledge of him the greatest knowledge that you ever have had? This is what John said. John said, my relationship to Jesus is the greatest thing. 
I mean, knowing him has been the greatest thing. My association with him, I seen him, I heard him, and all of that. John had a genuine love for Jesus Christ. Let me give you the second test. I call this the confession test. Do you confess your sins? Look down at verse number 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you confess your sins continually? Or we could say it like this. Do you have a sensitivity to sin in your life that previously you did not have? Before salvation, you might not even really be cognizant of sin. But after salvation, there's a new sensitivity to sin, so much so that John says, look, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. A a, a false believer will say, sin, what sin? I'm doing good. I mean, I've been to church two times this month. I'm doing good. I mean, I I haven't hit anyone. I haven't screamed at anyone. I haven't been angry at anyone. I haven't been speeding. I'm good. They don't have any cognizance of sin in their life. In fact, John says they claim to be Walking in the light, in verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. A true believer is constantly sensitive to their walk with the Lord and how sin breaks that fellowship, and they're constantly confessing their sin. You're not confessing sin because you're afraid you lose your salvation. You confess your sin because you're afraid you'll lose that fellowship. It's a continual confession of sin. You're sensitive to sin in your life so that you will confess it when it happens. And sometimes when you're praying and you get convicted, the Holy Spirit will bring it to light. You'll you'll deal with it. You'll confess it. You'll judge that sin in the light of Scripture. Here's the third test. I call this the commandment test. Do you have a desire to obey Jesus? Look in chapter 2. Look at verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. This couldn't be any clearer. A true believer will want to just keep the commandments of Christ. We're glad you've joined us today for this broadcast of The Ever Living Story, a media outreach of Grace Bible Baptist Church in Catonsville, Maryland. It's our sincere prayer that this broadcast has touched the spiritual needs of your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ has come into this world to change our lives, to bring us eternal life. And Grace is a local congregation where the Word of God is very clearly preached as you've just seen. We're located just off exit 17 of the Baltimore Beltway at 1518 North Rolling Road, Catonsville, Maryland. Let me leave you with this thought. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ has changed your life and he wants you to live out every day of it for his ever-living story.